Well, hello and welcome to this uh, week's Dividend Cafe, actually the final video Dividend Cafe of the year. We're going to have a written version next week that I don't think very many of you are going to read, being that it will be the week uh, in between Christmas and New Year's. But we're not going to do the video next week, uh, which means that this week I get to do two things, not only kind of give you the final video message in the Dividend Cafe for 2017 and what a year it has been, not only get to wish you all a wonderful holiday season, but I get to talk about perhaps what is the most meaningful market news event of the year, and that is the passage of the, the tax reform bill. We have talked about it, I got to think, uh, for 20 weeks now, almost half of the year. And a lot of the analysis that we've done have been uh, has been analysis about a particular iteration of the tax bill that was not itself the tax bill. The House had a version. We knew it was going to be changed. The Senate had a version. We knew it would be changed. They conferenced together. And really, I have to be very honest, it is surprising to me that they did not kind of meet in the middle between House and Senate or compromise, meaning perhaps peel back some of the stimulative benefits of one side or the other. Really, pretty much all elements of change from the conference where the House and Senate were to reconcile their two respective tax bills represented in something more beneficial to markets. I would consider most of the changes very good public policy. So you had a really substantial event this week. In, in, and it's nice for me to be able to do analysis on what is actually going to be the tax bill as opposed to various projected and proposed iterations we've had along the way. What we're looking at is indeed the second largest tax cut in American history. You have to go back to the 81 Reagan tax cut, the first of his two significant tax packages, the second of which was a full tax reform bill passed in 1986 on a bipartisan basis. That was really the last time anything that could be plausibly called tax reform took place. The difference is that we've had several tax cut packages over the years simply lowering rates somewhere in the tax code. We know what that is. It can be good, it can be bad, people can have opinions, but a tax cut is a tax cut. It has market meaning. This being tax reform in that there's an entire restructuring over significant parts of the tax code reflected into this tax bill. Uh, most meaningfully, of course, as we talked about for some time, is the business investment uh, tax system dramatically changing. Our corporate tax code, the rate, for incorporated entities coming from 35% of profits all the way down to 21%. But even more significant, uh, the repatriation of profits earned overseas coming back onshore at a one-time rate of 15.5% for cash, 7% um, uh, for non-cash coming back onshore one time. Um, that's mandatory, so you're going to have a lot of money coming back you're going to have a much lower rate going forward. That rate will kick in 2018, not 2019, which was a huge discussion point in the conference. And then the other piece that I uh, want to emphasize that is not being appreciated adequately by markets and certainly not by media, immediate expensing. The ability of companies to write down right away the full cost of capital expenditures. Business investment has been the missing ingredient in GDP growth for quite some time. Throughout the Obama administration, even when we came out of the Great Recession and there was some degree of modest, tepid GDP growth, the one thing holding it back between 1% and 2% instead of between 2 and 3% was inadequate business investment. The ability for companies now to not have to go through three-year and five-year and seven-year depreciation schedules and, and a lot of convoluted and complex ways that they could go about writing down the cost of actually investing into their own business, but the ability to go purchase new equipment, build new factories, invest in new technologies, and take that right down right away. The effective tax rates of United States companies, both large publicly held and much smaller businesses, um, is going to be collapsing making it extremely competitive uh, with the corporate atmosphere around the world, providing incredible incentive uh, for investment capital to come into the United States, making the United States more attractive 
for foreign capital, uh, for domestic capital that wants to, to stay invested here in the States. It's a big deal. It represents about $205 billion next year. You're talking about 1% of GDP, a little over 1%. Um, in one particular calendar year. That's significant fiscal stimulus. So one of the things I, I talk about in the DividendCafe.com this week, I have a chart of, is the way that the CBO projected GDP would grow out of our last big tax cut, which was 2003, and how they got it wrong three years in a row to the tune of about a trillion dollars of GDP that the uh, significant investment tax cuts that President Bush put through around dividends and capital gains and a lot of Pension Reform Act and things like that represented far more stimulus than was being appreciated. I think we're very likely to see a lot of that. How are these companies going to spend the capital? Um, if uh, from an investor standpoint, they buy back shares, um, I think that that's clearly beneficial in terms of the reverse dilution that takes place. I don't think you're going to see a ton of that. I think it's going to end up uh, being much less than people anticipate because there are some political optics around it that C-suites are afraid of, but also stock prices are high. There's going to be a more effective way, I think, for a lot of these uh, operators to use capital. Um, there's going to be a tremendous PR benefit out of increasing wages, paying bonuses, uh, investing into infrastructure, their own companies. You already saw this week a deluge of companies announcing such things. So I think you're going to see more and more of that we can't exactly say, I can say this, regardless of what companies do with it, it's going to be a more efficient use of capital and better at generating productivity than what has been the case now, which is this high, burdensome, non-competitive tax liability. So the markets have clearly priced in a lot of this. We're not saying that this is all brand new information. You have a stock market up 5,000 points um, over the last year in response to this. Uh, but valuations, frankly, all of a sudden look quite reasonable. You look at the earnings per share benefit from lower tax liability, all of a sudden the multiple we priced in comes from about 19 down to 18, 17. Still on the high end, but you still see earnings accelerating. And now you have this, this uh, uh, kick to uh, earnings per share growth, and it makes for, for a much different market environment. Um, we happen to believe that there are real particular spots that are going to benefit more than others. We love companies that have high capex, your defense, aerospace, industrials companies, really meaningful beneficiaries of this corporate tax reform, investing into the growth engines of the American economy. We think the energy sector is going to be a big beneficiary. The multinational companies, not quite as much. They're going to benefit on a go-forward basis and actually benefit significantly from the territorial tax system where there will no longer be a double tax on profits earned overseas. They'll be taxed one time and they can bring money back over. However, I don't uh, think that it has the immediate stimulative effect to the multinationals. Um, the technology sector already had a very low effective corporate rate. And so... Uh, you know, you're just looking at different uh, effects into different sectors, different companies. We're, of course, monitoring that quite, quite heavily. So regardless of the politics and regardless of what a lot of the rhetoric around all of this is, the bottom line is that this is a significant event for investors, significant event for the country. And we think there's going to be a tremendous amount of octane into the U.S. economy that will probably spill over into the global economy as well. There's one thing that Europe and Asia... Japan, emerging markets, China, all want is a growth partner. To the extent that U.S. is growing, the world uh, s seems to take a sort of infectious uh, uh, byproduct from that. So I do have to kind of leave most of the commentary this week with tax reform. That's been the most meaningful event. Repercussions or sort of uh, side effects, interest rates. You see the 10-year bond yield now getting back up close to 2.5% in the two fours. We started the year above 2.6. It went to uh, above 2.6 after President Trump was elected. It spent most of the year down around the 2.25 mark. It's moved a little bit higher. I would start to just take seriously the fact that you're probably going to get economic growth strong enough to warrant a 3% 10-year bond yield. Is that high? 
Is that um, a huge headwind? Not at all, but I would certainly be positioning bond portfolios, making real estate decisions and understanding uh, balance sheet decisions around the reality of, of slightly higher interest rates. But we do think that 2018 is going to be a year the Fed comes back into the news cycle. The Fed has been completely off the front page for 2017. You may have heard there's a guy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue who took a lot of press attention this year. Central banks got kind of a hall pass. They raised rates three times and barely anyone has talked about it. Now you have a new Fed chairman coming in, new Federal Reserve governors filling out that open market committee, probably a new paradigm around their policy approach, normalizing and having to do so in the context of what appears to be a really growing economy. We think 2018 is a year to revisit the thrilling topic of monetary policy. So I will leave it there for the week and I guess for the year. Now we will be doing more writing throughout the end of the year and we're still working and we're still present, but we're not gonna be able to do a video for you next week, but we'll launch the first video of 2018 with a kind of summary of 2017 and some really interesting projections into the new year. Uh, I will be writing an annual white paper to kind of summarize all the things that I'm looking at going into 2018. We're making some very high conviction secular determinations around portfolio positioning that we think are fascinating. In the meantime, what I want more than anything is for you all to have a wonderful holiday season. Enjoy this weekend. Enjoy time with family. May Christmas be a special day for you and yours. Thank you for listening to these videos each week. We always appreciate your suggestions and we remain as committed as ever to not only our passion for capital markets, but our passion for serving our clients in the way we manage such. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening.